County and a longtime member of the chamber. Uh, thank you to Rasmussen University for sponsoring this, and thank you to the chamber for giving me this forum. I appreciate you guys joining me today for what's a very personal topic, uh, but my goal here is to convey to you uh, some things of value that you can take back with you. Uh, the context that we're using is uh, leadership lessons I learned from my father. This is a picture of me and my dad. I'm learning to ride a bike. I'd like to point out that though this is a black and white photo, there was color photography when I was a child. I am not that old. My mom was trying to be artistic, and she captured this picture. I think a good place to start uh, would be, who is my father? Who is Larry Lehman? So, my dad is Larry Wayne Lehman, not Lawrence, Larry. Um, he was born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, and in high school, he moved to Orlando, Florida. After high school, he went to Florida State University and earned his degree in accounting. <clears throat> And after he graduated, he uh, got his CPA license, worked for a couple of CPA firms in Tallahassee, and then in his mid-20s, uh, struck out on his own, started a firm in 1973. He practiced uh, taxes until the mid-90s when he sold to his partners. And in the second half of his career, he managed uh, medical clinics, first in Tallahassee at an orthopedic clinic, and then in Gainesville, Georgia at a multi specialty practice. So that's kind of the biography and actually the, the last part, he moved down here, uh, he retired to Ocala about five years ago, was miserable in retirement, hated being retired. So he came to work at my office, he would tell you he worked with me, I would correct him and say that he worked for me. Uh, and then, you know, so that's, that brings you up to speed on his biography. But if you talk to anybody that knew my dad, the first thing that they would say about him is, that man was funny. Larry Lehman was a funny guy. He would often tell you a story, and, and more times than not, the butt of the joke is Larry Lehman. Um, you know, he would, he would talk about, he had a crooked finger. His pointer finger on his right hand was crooked because when he was a toddler, he went to help his mom with the laundry, and they had a ringer washer, and it got caught. And so he would, he would say he was the only guy that could point around a corner. <laughs> He'd also, and this was really nice, he would demonstrate for you how in high school he could pick his nose without taking his football helmet off. <laughs> so he would do that, or he'd tell you, like, this is him with red hair as a kid. He would walk home from school, and his neighbor's rooster would get so mad at his red hair, he'd jump up on his shoulder and peck his head. So my dad had to find a different way home. So he'd tell you stories like that. What the next thing people would tell you about my dad is, hey, that, that guy, he was a good guy. He was a good guy. But if people worked for my dad, they would tell you that he was the best boss that they ever had and that working for Larry Lehman changed my life. So let's jump into kind of some of the things that he shared with me about, we'll start with um, talking about like his defining principle. So my dad, what drove him wasn't material success or money, but what drove him was uh, achieving success through relationships. He defined success as seeing the people around him succeed, the people that work with him succeed, connecting others in ways that help them succeed. That's how my dad defines success. And I think for all of us, whether, that, whether we're owners of a business, managers, or, or you know, you're an employee working your way up, there are ways that you can apply how my dad approached life that I think could provide value. So. Oh, and, and if you spent time with my dad, you'd hear him say the same things over and over again, so that's what we're going to talk about. So I told him that he was like a chatty Cathy doll, you know, that pulled its own string, only had five things to say, and it said it over and over again. So we'll first talk about what he had to say about managing people. So with dad, he always said to me, son, you don't manage jobs, you manage people. And because you manage people, you manage personalities. My dad wasn't somebody that was well read or spent time you know, in, in study about how to manage people. This is just how he naturally approached managing people. He understood that to manage a person, to motivate a person, you have to know who they are, what drives them, what's going on in their lives. You know, he really, and, and it wasn't something he did studiously, meaning like, okay, let me write down what this, but he got to know his employees on a personal level. I talked with one of his employees, and I just want to read what she had to say. 
She said the biggest blessing, Larry, was to all of us is that we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he loved us and he had our backs. He always told us that he put people in places he trusted to do a great job. He took the time to get to know the employees, their children, and their families, and even more than that, he truly cared about them. So like when dad joined that practice, one of the, he made some small changes um, that made a big difference to his employees. So on everybody's birthday, he made sure they got $50. If somebody got married, they got $100. This employee told me he couldn't do anything for divorces. There were too many of those. So, uh, but those were small changes. Like an example, when he came to my office, uh, he encouraged me to change the timing of when we paid our Christmas bonuses. We always paid them in December. He said, son, if you could pay them the week before Thanksgiving, then employees could use those for Black Friday shopping. He just, it was little things, didn't cost me anything. It was just the timing that made a difference to the employee. One of his favorite things that he did um, at his clinics was he would throw a kid's Christmas party where everybody would bring uh, spouses, kids, dad would cook hamburgers and hot dogs. That was his favorite time of year because he felt like that really grew the connection between his employees. And these are things that he did that weren't terribly expensive or hard to do. It just showed everyone that he cared about them. The other thing that Dad did that made his relationship, uh, relationships at work special, is he connected with people on a human level. And basically, he, he kind of, he didn't hide his imperfections. He couldn't. I mean, look at the man. No, I, I just know that sarcasm was a love language in my household, okay? This was how I was raised. But dad wasn't afraid to show people he was human. You know, when you become a leader, a manager, you feel like, oh, i got to be perfect. I can't let people see that I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, dad didn't approach life this way. And I was so happy to find this picture uh, because one of his favorite uh, stories at work was when he approached these, these two ladies that he worked with and said, um, boy, when I stand around you two, I sure feel tall. And, uh, and this blonde lady said, um, well, Larry, when we stand around you, we feel thin. That was the kind of thing my dad loved from his employees, his friends. He loved to get picked on like that. And so as a manager, I think that made it so that his people felt really comfortable being with him, being around him, made, him, made them feel like they were, um, you know, they weren't around somebody that was perfect. The other thing he did, and you can't, can't quite see it here, but like at his, his uh, CPA office, they had a picture of his hand with the crooked finger. Um, above the kitchen sink, and it said, if you don't wash your own dishes, this could happen to you. And I, as I was going through the pictures, I saw countless examples of how he made himself the butt of the jokes, and I think that grew the comfort level. There was one picture, I wish I had included it, where they did like a Biggest Loser, like a, a weight loss contest among the, among the staff, and they gave him a little sash to wear and some flowers, and his sash said, just a loser. <laughs> so that was kind of how my dad approached things. Definitely not someone afraid to show his imperfections. So, okay, I don't know. All right, when I became a manager, I was terrified to say the words, I don't know. I felt like my credibility and my authority came from being smarter than everyone or being knowing the answers being in place because I know the answers and so when people would come to me with a question I would answer it I would find the answer I would tell them the answer whatever I would do it that's what I, my job was and I was telling dad that one day I said dad I'm doing a great job I'm answering everybody's questions and he said okay well then if you're answering their questions and effectively doing their job Who's doing your job? I said, what do you mean? My job is to answer these questions. He said, no, your job's not to answer these questions. Your company didn't bring you in to do their jobs. That's what they're for. That's what they're there for. I said, well, I don't understand. And he said, okay, try this. The next time somebody asks you a question, say, I don't know. What do you think? I said, okay, I guess I could try that. I'm thinking to myself, well, then what's my purpose? But I said, okay. So, you know, somebody asked me a question. I don't know. What do you think? And their response was the answer I was going to give. Okay, so I kept trying that and trying that. And I think eventually the people that worked for me were like, he's not going to tell me anyway, so I'm just going to do my job. And I found that this is the most powerful thing in management is to say, I don't know, what do you think? When somebody comes to you with a problem, encourage them to help find the solution. This empowers your employees to not 
need you to do their work. That's what one the, the employee that gave me the quote about how much he cared about them. I said, can you think of some times that dad might have made a mistake and used that to, to encourage people or whatever? And she says, honestly, your dad did such little work. I can't think of anything he did to make a mistake. And I thought to myself, you know, that's by design. I, I know when I first came here, uh, one of the people that, that I worked with at the time that now works with me at my new company, we have a great relationship. But when I first came, she was like, what does this guy do? He doesn't do anything. He makes everyone else do his work. My approach to work has always been, I don't want my job. I want my boss's job. And it's not because I want to displace my boss. I want you, the people that work with and for me, to want my job. So I'm going to train you to do my work. And I'm going to go to my boss and say, hey, what can I do for you? How can I make your job easier? How can I make my, your life easier? And that's what we can do whether we work for someone or that's what you do you know when you have clients you're trying to figure out how can i make your life easier and so you know in in an approach to management as the the way dad approached doing work was to delegate and then to work up and and i think that's a great approach that we can all apply in our lives so the next thing i want to talk about a little bit is how dad approached uh, mistakes all right so Making a mistake is not a sin. You know, if you're in an environment where people are punished for making mistakes, if people are fired for making mistakes, you know, it's, you're not going to be in a mistake-free environment. It does not exist. There is no mistake-free environment. Now, don't misread me. I'm not saying we should intentionally go out and make mistakes. But how we respond to mistakes can do a lot and say a lot about our culture. The feedback I got about dad and how he made people um, own their jobs is that when a mistake happened, they bring it to him and say, hey, oh my gosh, this happened. And dad's knee-jerk automatic response was always, well, nobody died. And that was the idea. The idea for him was, and, and what he wanted to convey to them was, it's fine. We made a mistake. Here's what we do. You own the mistake. You never run from it. That's what the environment of you can't make a mistake does. People won't own their mistakes. You own the mistake. You apologize to the stakeholders. You know, so if it's a client that was impacted, a fellow employee, your boss, you apologize, you own it, and then you take steps to make sure that it's not going to happen again. And that's how you approach mistakes. Um, What's fun about that is that he couldn't hold people too accountable for mistakes because of the level mistakes he made for me I know when I was working with him he called me into his office one day and he says Clay I got it this is going to make such a difference in your business and it's only going to cost you a thousand dollars and I said okay tell me about it so he said okay look it's five dollars a unit you need two thousand units one thousand dollars and I said oh okay Um, can you walk me through that again five dollars and he's like looking at me like dollars, 2,000 units, a thousand dollars. And I said, okay, dad, what's five times 2,000? And he looks at his paper, he looks at me, and he looks at his paper, he looks at me, he says, I thought something seemed off. <laughs> I just, shortcut five times 2,000 is 10,000, not 1,000. So uh, another thing that I love, and this is the kind of thing that dad would do, uh, we went to um, Firehouse Subs for lunch one day, and I had ordered our subs. We're waiting for the subs. I was holding our drink cups. I gave him his drink cup. He said, son, I'll get your drink. And I said, okay, Dad, I don't know this. So they had the Coke Freestyle machines at Firehouse Subs, and my dad in technology. <laughs> Bad news. So I said, I don't know, Dad. I, got, I get kind of a special drink. I, I don't want to. And he goes, no, no, I can do it. I said, Dad, I don't know that you can. And he says, no, I, I'll do it, I'll do it. Just give me a drink, what do you want? And so I said, okay, I want a, a diet, caffeine-free <laughs> cherry Coke, right? So it's like he's gotta hit four buttons, so. <laughs> so he comes back and he hands me my cup and I'm like, oh, okay, thanks, Dad. And I pick it up and I take a sip and it's root beer. And okay, so <laughs> ha ha, he played a joke because I'm being a pain in the butt. No, I said, Dad, I, I, this isn't, and he goes, you didn't want root beer? <laughs> Dead serious. <laughs> totally had no idea. So this is this is my dad. Now, uh, the next thing we're going to talk about. These are just sort of some 
some quick hitters that he would say over and over again. Dad was obviously in managing people, uh, felt, you know, had a lot to say about hiring and accountability. One of the things he said um, frequently to me, very frequently, was if you hire the right people, you don't have to put pressure on them. They put pressure on themselves. And it kind of goes back to the idea of if you're hiring the right people, you don't have to punish them for mistakes. They're going to punish themselves. And so, you know, the idea was just that he wanted people that um, he didn't have to. He, he always said, he, he said, I hire adults. You know, I don't hire kids that I have to chase around. I hire adults. I need you to be an adult. Um, the other thing he would say frequently, some people own their jobs and some people are just renting. You know, he always wanted you to own your job. And then all of that would, would be followed by. And this was something that was, it's hard as a boss. Like I always thought, you know, I always assumed that firing wasn't easy, but I figured, hey, if it's black and white, you know, you just fire the person. I have never, ever, ever had to let someone go where I was like, well, that was easy, no problem here, whatever, you know. And and, and I remember the first person I ever had to, to let go was, it was, we had a warehouse, um, at, the, at the place I was managing, it was a warehouse. We had inventory one weekend, and <clears throat> excuse me, and everyone knew you had to be at inventory. If you didn't attend inventory, then um, you you were fired. There was no if, ands, or buts about it. And I had an employee that didn't attend, did not have a reasonable reason not to attend, and so I had to let her go. And I called my dad after that because it was the first time I'd ever done it. I was I was like, Dad, man, I cannot believe how hard that was. And he said, that's because when you let somebody go, you're not firing that person. You're firing their spouse. You're firing their children. You're firing the people that work for them. That's a big burden. But he also said, you also have to remember that it's your job as the boss to do those things. You know, you want to work with people. You want to bring them you know, up to speed, give them an opportunity to improve. But ultimately, if you don't take action as the boss, it undermines the rest of the culture. Other people know when people are underperforming, it impacts them. So what he would tell me is that it's your responsibility to give people a job, it's their responsibility to keep that job. And so that's hard, you know, it's not easy, it's not fun, it's not, but it's the truth. Um, and it's, and like I said, it, it undermines your, your whole organization if you don't take those steps. Um, all right, so, the. The big thing for my dad, the thing that I would say, like I said earlier on, his sort of defining principle was all about connecting people. So this is his buddies that he used to run around with and, and they would go fishing on fishing trips. They called themselves the Loafers Glory Rod and Bottle Club. And, um, and so, you know, as a, a, an attorney, a construction guy, my dad was an accountant. That was what, he, he was always about connecting people. When you met my dad, First thing is, what do you do? Um, where did you go to school? Um, you know, he, he had this kind of list of what do you do for fun? You know, he really wanted to get to know you. I, I read the book, um, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, two years ago. And I, I, was, I thought it was a great book. I was surprised. I had waited so long to read it because, you know, it's a 100-year-old book. You would think it's not relevant anymore. It is. The relevance here, the reason I bring it up is... Like I said before, my dad wasn't a reader, but he could have written that book. One of the main tenets of the book, one of the main ideas, is to be interested instead of being interesting. Um, you know, that means instead of when you meet someone thinking, how do I impress this person? How do I tell them about myself? You want to find out about them. You want to connect with them. And that's what dad... That was, that was just who he was. He was interested in people. When he met someone new, he wanted to, if you were in a business that he wasn't familiar with, and my dad loved learning more about business. If your business was something he wasn't familiar with, he would ask you, oh wow, okay, what are the margins like in that? How much inventory do you have to carry? What's the turnover? What's the overhead? Or when we went to restaurants, oh my gosh, it's never like, wow, they have great pizza or whatever. We'd go in and he'd say, Clay, how many tables do you think there are in here? <laughs> How many times do you think they turn those over a day? What do you think the average ticket is? You know, those are the things that you always be asking about. And so when he met someone new, he would bring that together. He would be asking them about themselves. And then if he had the opportunity and found out a way that he could help you improve whatever you were working on, 
whether that was introducing you to the right person or bringing two people that, you know, an attorney and a real estate agent that need to be together, you know, to lunch, whatever, he would put that together. Um, I feel like there was some, there was, um, whenever, uh, when, when my dad passed away, which was uh, in March of last year, I heard from so many people, your dad introduced me to this person and that turned into this. Your dad did this for me that then turned into this. You know, he was, he was always building connections. The other thing I heard from people is about his level of appreciation for others. And so if you knew my dad for any period of time, you would be, you would receive either one of his quiches or, uh, or some peanut butter fudge. Okay. That was his way of like loving on other people. And I, when he got sick and was in the hospital here in town, he was only here for a couple years. Some of the people that visit him blew my mind. So two of the tellers from First Federal Bank, where we, where we bank, came to see him because when he would take our deposits, he would always slip in some fudge mm -hmm. in a little thing. I mean, and so my dad had this way of showing people that he appreciated them, that really um, drove that connection. So as I think about like how can we take this, you know, information or the things that dad, you know, the way he approached life, how that helped him succeed, how can we apply that in our lives? I think the easy thing is, you know, just show more care for others. And, and I'm not saying anybody's not caring or what. I just you know the way that he approached work was just there was no veneer, there was no. And maybe sometimes there should have been, <laughs> but, but there was really just, there was no separation between who he was personally and who he was professionally. And, and I think that drove his employees to really connect and, and drive themselves to accomplish their goals. Um, you know, he, as, as the employee that I quoted earlier stated, he had their backs and cared for his employees. And that drove them to be more successful in what they were doing. And then the way that he appreciated others was really special. And so I think, you know, to, the way I'd probably like to close today is just to tell you a little story about the Hershey's bars that I brought. Um, here, I'll, I'll grab one so that I can just show. So these aren't protein bars. Um, that was a sad piece of news that I got. Um, so these are what dad referred to as Larry dollars. Um, so as I said, when he wanted to love on someone, he would either bake them a quiche or uh, take them uh, some of his fudge that he would make. But when he got sick and was in the hospital, he couldn't do that. So my primary job in life was to make sure he was stocked with what he called Larry dollars. And when he started doing this, I rolled my eyes. Okay, so what he would do is, if a nurse came in and did something, you know, kind of above and beyond, he would give them a Larry dollar. And I thought to myself, I mean, this lady, you know, th these people make like great money and, and like, I think it's kind of demeaning that you're giving them, you know, a Hershey bar. And, and so <laughs> you wouldn't believe the way that people's faces lit up, you know, when dad would give them a Larry dollar. And so, you know, he would, and he would say to me, I I'd bring him like 10 or 15, and then two days later, he'd be like, Clay, I need you to give me some more Larry dollars. <laughs> what are you doing with these things? But, you know, again, when he passed, you know, he, had, he had just loved on people with these. And then um, in terms of just the way that he prioritized appreciation, uh, when I got the call the, the morning that he had passed, the nurse, the hospice nurse that called was clearly emotionally impacted. And I thought... For someone that does this for a living, that was unusual. And she said that um, all the way to the end, your dad, he was saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. He was appreciating what she was doing on his behalf. So I think if we could take anything away from this, it's to, you know, drop the veneer, um, to just show people that you care, and just find the little ways that you can appreciate people. And, and then look for a way to drive success through connection. Thank you guys very much for letting me speak to you today. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or talk more about this or anything else. So thank you.